And we're working on the, the book of the Psalms, the first couple of Psalms this time of year that we thought would be helpful. And last week we had a great message on Psalm 2, serving the Lord and celebrating life. And, and it was a great message. And if you're like me, you're, you're listening and thinking, boy, I, I need to, that's what I want to do. I want to serve God better. I want to celebrate who Jesus Christ is. And then life happens. And I don't do what I talked about or heard about on Sunday. And a lot of you are probably the same way. Well, so was this character in the Bible named David. Uh, he had some great ideas. Uh, wrote some great psalms. Wrote Psalm 2, wrote Psalm 3. But he didn't always implement what he talked about. So between Psalm 2 and Psalm 3, something happened. Now, they weren't written chronologically. But Psalm 2 is this great worshiping God. And Psalm 3 has some very awkward phrases in it. Now, to understand really uh, what Psalm 3 is about, you need to understand the context in which it was written. And uh, the text tells you it was written during the time of Absalom. You see, David, King David, had a rather convoluted family, to say the least. He practiced polygamy, which in those days was not unusual, nor considered immoral. He had lots of kids by different wives. And when this thing took place, all those children were now young adults. And his oldest son was called Amnon. His mother was Ahinoam. And his third oldest son was Absalom. His mother was Micaiah. And there was also a daughter named Tamar in there. Her mother was also Maak. I can't pronounce that name well. Maakah. So Absalom and Tamar, brother and sister, Amnon, half-brother. Amnon was attracted to Tamar in the way you shouldn't be attracted to your half-sister. And he uh, tried a few things. She rebuffed his advances. And finally, he just took over and he raped her. Now, that made David, King David, very, very angry. This was his daughter, his son who did it. He's the king. You know what David did? Anybody know what David did? Nothing. He took no action, not as a father, not as a king, for justice. Well, this made Tamar's real brother, full brother, Absalom, very unhappy. He was seething with anger. He's a smart guy. He waited for just the right time to act. And about two years later, when Adonai was out of this capital city on some kind of errand, Absalom and his friends jumped him and killed Amnon, murdered his brother. Well, now King David is really angry and also mourning the loss of his oldest son. And what did David do this time? You know what he did this time? Nothing. No action against Absalom, not against the people who helped him out, not against anybody else. Now, Absalom was afraid he might do something, so he leaves town and flees to another country where his mother was from. And for a number of years, has no contact with the family back in the hometown. None. But after a while, from intermediaries, uh, he, he gets back to the capital. But David will have nothing to do with him. Doesn't want to speak with him. Doesn't want to see him. Pretends he's not even there. Well, that certainly hurts Absalom. Because Absalom, being the smart guy he is, decides he's going to take advantage of the situation. He was tall, he was athletic, he was good-looking, he was popular with the people. So he stood near the city gate. That's where people hung out in those. That was a kind of the Starbucks of the day. And when anybody ever complained about the king, he said, you know, if I was king, I'd take care of you. Or they had a complaint about what was going on. If I was king, we'd fix that. And he began to build his base. That's what they say today in that politics, build his base. But in those days, there were no elections. If you wanted to become the king, you had to get rid of the old king in a violent, forceful overthrow. And that's what Absalom did. He gathered together all those people he was helping out or talking to and his own army troops, and they took over the capital and the palace and the kingdom. And King David had to flee with his household and his troops out of town, out of the country for their own safety. That's when he wrote Psalm 3. So let me read this for you. Follow along on the screen. Uh, I'll read from the um, New International Version. Now imagine the context this is in. 
Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? It's the family he's talking about. Men are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me. My glory is the one who lifts my head. I call out to the Lord. He answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord. Deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. You can hear in there some of the heartbreak of David, some of the heartache, and his plea for help from God. So what happened to David, this great psalm reader, writer, this, this great leader? How did he get in this position? Well, we can surmise that somewhere along the line, he lost his way spiritually. Because when Tamar was raped, had he been following closely to God, he would have done something. And when Amnon was murdered, had he been close to God, he would have done something. But he didn't. He was experiencing what we call soul neglect. He was being king, being a general, but not taking care of his relationship to God. And a lot of us can identify with that. We do the things we're supposed to do, but somehow that gets neglected. If you read what David's life was like before this happened, you'll, you'll find maybe, maybe he was wandering far away from his relationship with God. Because the events that took place before that were equally despicable. You recall that at this point in David's life, he was the king. They had cap captured Jerusalem at their capital. He built a palace. He sent his troops out to battle. He stayed home to enjoy the good life in the palace. That's when he had an affair with Bathsheba. That's when he arranged for Bathsheba's husband to be on the front lines of battle so he, he would be killed and that would hide the affair. That's when Bathsheba was pregnant and gave birth to a son who died in infancy as God's punishment for his adultery. And then he had the problem with Absalom. David had lost touch with his love and faith in God. He was suffering soul neglect. It happens so easily to us Christians. We get involved in life, doing what we ordinarily do. We go to work, take care of the family, have some friends, play a little golf, go on vacation. And we just forget. We neglect. And maybe you've seen some of the symptoms in your own life of what I call soul neglect. And one is, one is kind of a spiritual depression. That happens when, when life is pretty good. Life is comfortable. There's no big crisis going on. You're successful in the job or with the family. Um, there's no huge problem to worry about. And we just kind of feel funny about God. Like, well, I love the Jesus, but it's just okay. Or we kind of forget to pray on occasion. Or we kind of skip church on occasion. And then it becomes more than just an occasion. And we, we find this depression. Like we don't want to deal with God anymore. Remember the story of Elijah? You read about it in 1 Kings chapter 18. Elijah was a prophet of, of, in Israel. And there were 450 prophets of a false god, Baal. And they had this big contest. A great contest. It's fun to read about it. It's a funny story. Uh, and Elijah wins the contest and destroys the prophets of Baal. A great victory for Elijah, for God, for the people of Israel, for their faith. How does Elijah respond? Here's what he says from 1 Kings chapter 19. He went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. What, what happened to Elijah? This great victory. And then all the prophets of Baal got Israel back on track again. And he feels depressed. Because doing great work 
doesn't mean we'll have a great connection to Christ. Spiritual service doesn't make us immune from spiritual depression. And we have to keep track of ourselves. Am I really staying up with my relationship with Christ? This connects to another symptom you might have seen. I call it busy but empty. Uh, This symptom is people get really busy doing good things. And then they are so busy they neglect the important things. This is what happened to Elijah. Did great stuff in Israel. Spoke the word of God. Remember, prophets in those days were, were, were speaking the word of God to the people. But he forgot to speak the word to himself. So what happened to David. David was busy. He was king, had to run the whole country. He was general, had to run the whole military. He was uh, kind of in charge of the tabernacle with the priests and the Levites and the tabernacle. He had a big family to take care of. And he lost track of his faith in Christ. And some of us Christians do the same thing. We get really involved in church. Forget why we're there. And these people who get busy think, if I just get more busy, it'll cover over the the pain I feel of being distant from God or the absent from God. I'll, I'll not worry about it as much anymore. It won't, it won't feel so bad if I get busier. It's like the athletes who, who know when they, when they train pretty hard that eventually the, the body produces a hormone called endorphins and it, it dulls the pain of training. I was cycling with my son Brett a couple weeks ago in Washington State, and we were, I thought it was going to be an easy ride, but uh, we ran across a pretty big hill, long and steep. And I'm awful on hills. Well, I was going to make it up there. I took my time. But halfway up, my legs are searing in pain just from the trying to climb up that hill. But I knew eventually those endorphins would kick in. I'd make it to the top. Now, the pain didn't go away. It just kind of lessened a bit. And I got up there. And some folks recognize the pain of being distant from God, not knowing how to connect to God, not having the prayers heard anymore, not realizing they're missing Scripture. And they think, if I get busier, that'll kill the pain. But it doesn't. It leaves us in the midst of soul neglect. Which is kind of like another system or symptom of soul neglect. I call it being overwhelmed by life. When there's so many things to do, so many demands on our time, that what gets left behind? Imagine the demands on David's life when he was king. Everyone wanted to talk to the king. Uh, Everyone had to get the king's ideas and decisions on things. The army had to be taken care of. He had four wives, a lot of demands right there, all these children. Um, He had a lot of demands on his life. And when demands pile up, what gets left behind? Sometimes the most important things. When I first became a pastor, I struggled with this because there were so many demands on a pastor. You have to have your teaching ready for every Sunday and uh, uh, Bible studies you're preparing for and people to visit and committees to form and meetings to go to, and there's all these demands. You finally have to say, wait a minute, I'm going to have to decide what's important here. And some demands don't get met. Otherwise, I'm going to be overwhelmed. And the most important thing, my relationship with Christ gets left behind. At that point, we have to ask ourselves this question. Whom are we trying to please? Trying to please the spouse, the kids, the grandparents, relatives, the boss, the church, the community, the township? Whom are you trying to please with your life? Well, read Thessalonians and ask yourself what Paul says. And Paul says, we're trying to please God. That's the only demand we have to respond to. And if in pleasing God, we don't please somebody else, that's unfortunate, but pleasing God is more important. If in pleasing God, someone else is disappointed, that's unfortunate, but we want to please God. If we don't, we get overwhelmed with all these demands and we lose touch with Jesus Christ. I've seen this one other time in churches where, where people work well in the church, but they, they at some point withdraw from leadership and responsibility. People work well. I've, I've seen elders who serve on the board for 
two or three terms, whatever it happens to be, and when the term is over, they disappear. Stop coming to worship, drop out of Bible study or small group. The Bible collects dust on the shelf in the bedroom. What happened? They get burned out. Spent all this time serving in leadership and being responsible for people and not being responsible for themselves. But I felt like this in my last church. It was a, a young dad, great faith in Christ, I thought, and really growing in his faith, so we put him on the mission committee. And then he became chairman of the mission committee. We had a great meeting one night. We talked about with the whole committee about the missionaries we supported. We had information from them, from the newsletters and from online. We had uh, uh, posters going up around the church on missions. We had plans to involve more people in missions in the future. It was a great meeting. The next day he called me. He was resigning as chairman of the committee. He was resigning from the committee. He was resigning from the church. I first thought, what happened? What? How did it go from Wednesday night, great meeting, to Thursday afternoon, resigning? Because he was burned out. He did so much with us in the logistics and the meetings and mechanics, he forgot to nurture his spirit and his relationship with Jesus Christ. I should have seen it. I was his pastor. I should have seen it coming, but I didn't. Now, that has a happy ending. He was a smart guy and figured it out and got back on track eventually, but... At the moment, it was pretty hard to see. But these are symptoms of soul neglect. And this is what happens to us when we don't think about our relationship with Christ or kind of ignore it or we have habits and practices that get in the way of it or we have habits and practices that we don't do that would help us. And sometimes we end up like David. We've been kind of away from Christ for just, just a little bit too long, and something happens. Enemies, problems, who knows what. And we don't have the spiritual resources to deal with it. And like David, we go crawling back to God, pleading with God for help. Now, if you read through Psalm 3 again, you'll see that David did, did find a way to kind of recapture his faith, to rebuild what he had lost to get back to where he was earlier in his life. And if we find ourselves having neglected our spirit, going through the motions, overwhelmed with life, too busy for Jesus, maybe we should pay attention to these responses that, that David had in Psalm 3. This is how to get it back when we've lost it. This is what we need to do. And it's not a lot of actions. and It doesn't happen out there happens in here, and it comes from above. When we realize all these things we do are really by God's power, not our own power. So the first thing David says here, he has confidence in God's ability to answer prayer. God's ability, not that he will answer the way we like, his ability to answer prayer. God has that kind of power. That begins our road back. Now, David had a track record that, that understood this. He, he understood that God, God could answer prayers, that God protected his people, that God cared about his people. You know, when David was guarding sheep in the fields outside Bethlehem and the lion and bear would attack, God protected him. God protected David when he went against the, the Goliath giant from the Philistines. God protected David uh, when he did battle against the army of the Philistines. God protected David when his own king, King Saul, attacked him. So David knew God has the ability to answer our prayers. He has the ability to help us, to change us. That's where it comes from. Henry Smith wrote a great song a couple years ago called He Is Able. Maybe you've heard, of it, heard it. It's not a very long song. The first line is this. He is able, more than able, to accomplish what concerns us today. That's exactly what David put in his psalm. God is able to accomplish what concerns us today, no matter what it is. No matter what the concern is, God has that power. It's God's power, not ours. David may have been working on his own power for a while as king. That's why he had these problems. Or his own power in his family life. That's why he had these problems. It's God's power. 
So his first response was, God has the ability. Now, you might not get the answer you like, but God can do what God wants to do. The second way he responded was to say he's going to trust in the Lord. And here's an interesting phrase in here. Even though he says, tens of thousands assault me on all sides. That's a lot of people. Remember warfare in those days didn't have anything to do with drones or, or cruise missiles. Warfare was a bunch of people. One army over here, one over here, and they meet in the middle, and they literally beat each other to death with swords and clubs and shields and bows and arrows and slings, whatever else they had, until the last army standing was the winner. So imagine being surrounded by tens of thousands of military troops. Frightening. But he says, the Lord will protect me. I trust the Lord even though I'm surrounded by tens of thousands of people. That's trust. Not in our power. Not in what we can see in the future. But in God's ability to work through us and produce things for his glory. For what he wants. The third way that he put up there to respond is to ask God for help. And we can do that. Because if God has the power to answer our prayers, and if we trust God, then asking God for help is the obvious solution. And he does that here. He asks God to, to help him. Deliver me, O Lord, he says. Put a shield around me, he says. Do these things for me. And we're in the same position sometimes. We need to ask God for help. Ask. James says we have not because we ask not. It may be a small ask, an uncomfortable conversation with the spouse. It may be a big ask. I'm broke and out of money and they're foreclosing on my house. We ask. Even though tens of thousands gather around us. And sometimes we Christians feel like there are tens of thousands assailing us on all sides. Jason mentioned last week that we sometimes feel in a minority now in our country because because of our theology and because of our personal sexual ethics, we seem to be a, a shrinking minority. And there are tens of thousands of our citizens barking at us, calling us out of step, old-fashioned, stubborn, homophobic, or just plain wrong. And we say we, we're going to ask God for help, to quiet the critics, to give us peace. At the end of the psalm, David asked God to strike the jaw of the enemies and break his teeth. It's a pretty violent request, isn't it? I think it's a metaphor for quieting the critics. In the second verse, he says, many will say, God will not deliver him. So picture the scene, Absalom getting all these people to, to kind of go against David. All of them say, David's not a good king anymore. Let's get rid of him. It's the skeptics and the cynics and the critics that were giving David a hard time. And we Christians, increasing in our society, find the skeptics and the critics and the cynics giving us a hard time for our faith, for our values, for our ethics, the way we behave. And David says, God can answer that prayer. We can trust God in that environment. And the reason is, not for anything we do, but for what God does. Look in the psalm for all the things God does in David's one little psalm, these few verses. God answers, God shields, God sustains, God delivers, God blesses. That's what God does. And we who know Jesus Christ understand and appreciate and appropriate all that power of God when we have faith and trust and pray. But if we neglected our Holy Spirit, if we neglected God's place in our lives, if we've ignored our relationship with Christ, if we haven't maintained that relationship well, then when we really need it, we find it difficult to understand or appreciate or appropriate God's power and God's help. The final line of the psalm says this, from the Lord comes deliverance. May your people be your blessing from the Lord. 
all the great things David could do, all the skills he had, all the power he had, he knew at the bottom of it, it all came from God. If we don't succumb to soul neglect, we'll be able to say in our lives, from the Lord came our deliverance. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the Word of God from Psalm 3. The fact that David could put his struggles in words that we can now read years later, use them in our lives. Lord, help us recognize those symptoms of soul neglect. Help us to maintain our love for you. So in all ways and every day we can know we're in Christ's place and Christ's love and Christ's power and Christ's protection. We pray in his name. Amen.